what I've got here are some myths and facts about autism, um, which I could go through, and unless anyone's got any other questions or anything in particular that they'd like me to talk about, like I said, it's fine to ask me anything. Could, uh, not necessarily now, it could be now or when you finish, but um, I'd, just, I'd, I'd just be really interested to hear about, for you, the process of getting a diagnosis and what that was like. And how oh yeah, that's something I meant to cover, thanks. It's something I often get asked. Well, we were living in Doncaster, which um, I find, I think even today it might be quite like the Dark Ages. Like I find, um, in, it was really difficult to find a social worker that had respect or, or a brain even. We were lucky we got one that did, but I think um, Doncaster in general, that was my experience of them. Um, it was the Doncaster education system. It was because of them I couldn't get a diagnosis in the first place. Like, even though um, my mum approached various professionals, every one of them were arrogantly against her. Um, so eventually, when um, I'd left school and I was struggling with them, um, college and, and little part-time jobs that were on and off, um, there was another professional and because I had, I had no friends, because being autistic I couldn't really make friends, I had no concept of how to talk to another teenager, even though um, in some workplaces I'd sometimes um, enjoy conversations with people, but I felt really sad all the time, like the grown-up world were completely grey and dull and nothing in it for me, so um, and I just longed for the nice colourful play equipment of places like Sundown Adventureland. Does anyone know Sundown Adventureland? That's one of my favourite places in the world. I mean, it's lovely, um, I, but it's quite difficult um, to find people that want to go and share it with me. Um, I'll go with Trisha, my support worker that's here today. Um, but it is lovely because they're quite um, open to adults going without children but the equipment's mostly quite small. But I, would, I am hoping um, to write a review on them because um, it's wonderful as it is, but there's a few things I'd like to suggest, like lockers to put your stuff, as they, they encourage parents to actively <coughs> play with the children on the equipment. They obviously need lockers to put bags, coats, phones. Um, and obviously, seems to be improving as there is now some bigger equipment, some lovely indoor equipment that adults can now go on. It used to have a height limit but doesn't appear to now. Um, and I think I'd like them to continue in that way. And um, I think I did start doing a review after a particularly good Christmas trip we had there um, about 18 months ago. But I haven't been able to get to it because of all the bad things that's happening in the world, such as the cuts, um, Atos putting cruel expectations onto people, all these various issues have got it in the way. So I've been busy writing about um, advocate, advocating for people that are suffering. So, and obviously stress that happens in my life stops me from getting on with things that I really want to do. Um, and then the difficulties with technology. Um, so to get my diagnosis, I'm digressing. Um, I think what happened, I, I was seeing another professional who, there was a, the psychologist at school who I felt at the time was the only friend I had in the world. So I was quite dependent on her because I couldn't make other friends. Um, apart from in the special schools, I, I did have some form of friendship with the other girls because, and, and the other boys, but it, it were girls' dormitory, it were a boarding school. And in a way, I did really want to go there rather than um, stay at mainstream and have all the social exclusion. So it was something I, I wanted to do and it was something that we sort of decided so I could have some social inclusion. 
So I'm glad I had that experience with having some friendships with kids my own age, which I wouldn't have had at all if I'd stayed in mainstream. I think I would have had a lot more excessive bullying from children at mainstream schools. So between the ages of 17 and 22, um, I often went to various different professionals um, to try and find help, find answers. Um, and this counsellor suggested I had Asperger's, which I thought, well, maybe that makes sense because these professionals are saying I'm not autistic. They've always said I'm not. My mum's saying I am. I've heard the word Asperger's before, so maybe that's an explanation. But when I finally got my diagnosis, it, it was autism, not Asperger's, though it presents as Asperger's now. So I think the, the group support worker that were running the autistic group, I think um, she gave us some support at the time. We involved the police, but it, it didn't go to court because it would have been really difficult proving that I didn't know the consequences of what I was going into even though um, developmentally, socially, emotionally, I was very naive. I didn't have any, anywhere near the same awareness that another adult of my own age would have had. So, so it, it did have a good outcome in the end. Um, is there any more questions? What were your experiences with that task group? Like you mentioned previously about your experiences with access group and the expectations you have of people. What were your experience yourself with them? Right. Um, well, I'm a bit worried something might have got lost in the post because I haven't heard from them myself. But I have had... Um, I think... But for other people... Um, I've recently done a letter to them which I think is on Facebook regarding um, clients being put through a lot of stress when they're really not equipped to do a job and then having their appointments cancelled without even being told so they have to go all through all the stress of travelling there and I don't think ATOS have any um, concept of difficulties like autism. Now there is um, an Atos question that I did think about using in, in my talk, such as, there's a question that says, can you pick up a pound coin? Now, on a good day, I can do tricks like this with a pound coin, but on a bad day, such as, I mean, I've gone through a couple of these forms with different people, and it's things like, can you pick up a pound coin? Can you set an alarm clock? And I've often thought how I'll word them when my form comes along. But I can be in a shop and if I'm rushed, I can find it really difficult to do the simplest thing. And this goes for a lot of autistic people. And then often it can lead to a chain of events, such as dropping one thing after the other, um, forgetting to do my bag up, um, all sorts which can impact on the rest of someone's functioning for the whole day, especially if they're in a bad patch or under stress to start with. And also, can you set an alarm clock? That's something that's um, a bit like the stuff that I was talking about with seeing somewhat something in my room, um, not being able to physically see an object. It's similar with, um, I had some stress lately and we have storage heating in our home and if I'm under any stress, because I, I always set the boiler at night um, so we'll have hot water the next day, I'll, my mum has difficulty seeing um, and learning anything digital. Um, I'll physically just not process what the numbers are, are saying and physically get it an hour out and then, and then it means a cold bath the next day. And that can happen to people with autism lots more than average people. And it's the same with such as I was writing about the travel passes recently. Um, I have done a letter about that online which everyone will be able to look at. Um, I've been involved in the Freedom Ride protests such as um, Often people with autism 
can look at a boss and not process um, what the word is saying, what the destination is saying. So there's regular getting on and off wrong buses or not recognising your surroundings. And it happens such a lot more than with average people. Um, was the other lady going to say something? Sorry. Um, you said your mum got diagnosed in her 60s. Yeah. How did that come about? Well, I was seen as a counsellor at St George's for 11 years. Um, that was because of all the damage and trauma caused by being undiagnosed and, um, and the issues I'd had with professionals. And counselling was also offered to parents, because often parents are, are traumatised by um, what the kids have been through, through being undiagnosed. Um, and I think she come about seeing that she had Asperger's too, um, though hers is a more hidden and generally able form. Um, there's a lot of things that are severe, severely difficult for her that most people don't find difficult, such as learning to find her way and learning technology. Um, so her diagnosis come about through seeing the counsellor and talking it through but there was somebody uh, maybe more than one person that had suggested a few years ago that she could have asperger's or autism so um so she went to her gp to get the diagnosis and luckily we had a, a decent gp in in sheffield i mean we have been quite lucky in sheffield we've had some forward-thinking GPs, but that's not the case for everyone. I mean, a, a lot of people have had GPs that have said really ignorant, damaging things, such as, you've been okay this far, why do you need a diagnosis? So, um, the GP wrote a decent letter, and, um, and she saw somebody at East Glade and got a diagnosis, but the person there didn't, although we're good at diagnosing, didn't really have a good understanding of Asperger's and the right sort of approaches. So some of that were quite traumatic as well. Um, I mean, I had my diagnosis from Professor Tantum, um, which is, is quite well known. And I was seeing a counsellor that was working for him at, at St George's. Um, is there any more questions? Um, my friend has got a daughter who's autistic and she doesn't speak, but she wants to know what is going on in her mind and like when she's really upset or when she suddenly laughs a lot and how, can, how she can communicate with her in those moments, especially when she's upset and she wants to comfort her. Right. Um, I think it can be quite difficult, but um, probably the best thing to do is observe what might be happening in the surroundings that make her upset or a lot of people with non-verbal autistic you use pictures i mean it even i use pictures to communicate sometimes so maybe if there's some pictures um, i mean i'm sure she's probably thought of all all these things already um but if there's a, a lot of pictures that can be used for to say what she wants or how she's feeling even. Are there like specific things, like general things that you could say, these things generally upset the one with autism more than others, but these things make autistic people happy more than others? More common ones, are there, um, are there any main? Sorry, say that last bit again. Uh, like any, 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 let's say, events or things that go on in your life that upsets people with autism more than others or make them happy more than yeah, others? Yeah, it can be different things with different people. I mean, there may be certain noises that are painful to some um, or other sensory stimuli that's just too much for a person with autism. Like, sometimes a lot of talking, just too much input in general can cause overload. But probably... Um, if there's any particular things that she finds comforting, even if it's not the social norm, um, it's 
probably a good idea to encourage these things. Um, I mean, when I was a little girl, um, going back to this article about um, autistic people being taught social skills, um, I think it's often social pressure and being stopped to do the rituals that help them keep the nervous system calm that often does damage and causes a lot of upset such as there was some talk in the article about children being stopped from rocking when that has a calming influence on some people with autism and I think it was with the intention the good intention of preventing bullying which um, I mean if the person is really equipped to be able to live up to that in certain social situations such as if they really want to travel on a bus themselves to get to places then yeah fine but there needs to be lots of safe environments where the person can be themselves and I think it's more important to teach society a more positive way is to teach society to accept these things and understand the reasons why I mean me I don't get a lot out of them um, rocking itself it would be brilliant if I did but I happen to need a real rocking horse a real seesaw oh, and a real person to go on the other end because trying to do things myself I find is just like having a seesaw and not having anyone on the other end but as a, a small child I had various dolls or, or pieces of a string and I would walk around the garden repetitively tap or stroke them and it would usually be for about 15 minute intervals at the time and this is a, a doll I've got now that I've had a few years but the thing is I, I don't play with her enough I've been too caught up with other things to really um, get into the way I used to be and but what I was doing was making up stories in my head or I'd quietly tell them out loud to whatever in the garden might be listening like fairies or animals or whatever and and they were quite creative some were quite bizarre stories and I think now I've attempted to make a start on writing and developing and building on them because that's something I want to do um, and make them into children's books because the ones I did then were children's stories and I think I would really like to write my own biography as well which I've also made a start on but I'm trying to do bits of research and get a few facts right about things um, but it could be that when she's laughing to herself um, she might have some sort of elaborate game going on in her head or I think some autistic people when when they're rocking it's probably something that they're not able to express at this stage but um, there's probably all sorts going on like it's a lot more than just a simple repetitive movement now I think we'll probably stop for you know a cup of tea and a biscuit soon but has anybody else got any questions or anything can I just ask uh, an, an autistic adult do you think like my daughter's non-verbal and can't read or write do you think they are easier that's the wrong word less stressful not being able to do that as yourself <coughs> not so much more going on in there because she's 32 now she's non-verbal still and can't read and write so is there a world safer if you like well in some ways but it really depends on the individual and how they feel like if she's happy and she has a good support network and if her senses aren't causing a and the environment isn't causing a distress then yeah fine and yeah yeah it's quite a different set of problems but often the sensory issues are similar like someone with Asperger's that may appear very high functioning I've found a lot of them have a lot more severe sensory issues than what I appear to have um, like I think since having the access to play and then coming to my idea about trust and freedom I think I've felt a lot more calmer and at peace in life and in general um, so I think it might be about finding 
what the person finds particularly comforting and embracing that, which is what, what I'm trying to do with um, what I, I'm setting up. You, you mentioned a particular drug which worked for you rather brilliantly over four days, I believe you said. Oh, didn't I say citalopram? Yes, I, you did give a name, I listened to catch it. I just wonder, how long did you keep that up and uh, did you find it long lasting? Well, I'm still on it now. It, it would, I think it was um, late 2007 um, because I think that there were still some ongoing difficulties with housing. I mean, we have had another move since then to a more peaceful place, um, which has given me yet another new lease of life. Um, I have sometimes attempted to cut down really slowly, but it might simply be that my body and brain need it because, um, because life in general is much more stressful for people with autism. My brain chemistry could be prone to going out of balance and because I've had years of the wrong kind of mismanagement really that has caused a lot of damage. So I'll keep an open mind to coming off it. I mean, in many ways I'd like to, it'd feel help, a lot healthier, but, um, but it's been such a productive few years being on it that it's definitely been worth it for me. It's just, um, Tracy, thank you so much. It's been a really, really interesting talk. Um, and I don't know if you could answer this question or not, because I know you've only got your own experience, but do you think that being a girl has kind of hindered you getting the diagnosis? Because we know that a lot more boys get an ASD diagnosis. So is it, I mean, it might be difficult for you to say because you only know your experience, but do you think that might have had something to uh, do with it? Yeah, the, the psychologist, I, I don't know if she meant this as a fob off, but the really bad psychologist, just said, you are not autistic, they are all boys and they don't talk. But I think if I'd have been a boy, she'd have found a similar excuse. But she was very unprofessional anyway, like she befriended me and she was telling me really personal business of other clients and I, it were easy enough for me to find their names. Um, so I think there is a lot of myths about um, about autism being more common in boys. Like I did look up some stuff on the internet yesterday and some of the stuff was still quite old fashioned, like nine boys have Asperger's to one girl with Asperger's. But the numbers are a lot more equal. But I think, um, I think it's probably can be more hidden in girls, but that's not my main area of expertise. Um, But, um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, do you ever get a period of what you might call self-hypnosis, where you, for instance, you, you pick up a book that you've read a hundred times before, and you find yourself reading it, uh, unable to stop for five or ten minutes or even more, uh, with that, with, and at the same time knowing that it's uh, quite daft to do so, you know, it has no uh, uh, result or anything to it, it's just a waste of time. How can you get out of such a sort of obsession, I suppose? Now, for instance, I keep picking up books on, on wartime things, which I've got a, a large number of them, and I just keep reading them. Whenever I go into that room, I pick up a book and read it. You know, I keep trying to discipline myself to get rid of them all, but I can't do it. I think um, I've probably done things like that from the past, like I'd read or, or watch things that cause me an anxiety because I needed to find out everything I could about those subjects. But I found it counterproductive in the end and it came to a head and caused me too much anxiety. So I'd have absolutely nothing to do with those things. But um, I think it, it probably brought into the open some of the traumas that I'd been through and that's why I were drawn to looking at certain things. Um, but that's probably something I'd like to write about in more depth at some point. But I think now, um, since being on the pills really, I, I probably um, read things in, in short periods rather than long. Um, 
which I think is better and healthier for a lot of people. I mean, some people, they'll sit in one position hours and hours reading something. And I'm not sure if I've managed to answer your question properly. But. It, uh, <laughs> um, no, it's something you can't control, as it were. Um, it's yeah. hard to stop it rather, rather than... Uh, well, you said, you, you said, in fact, you've got the discipline to, to stop after five minutes. But mm -hmm. doing, doing this silly thing, it, it does tend to calm oneself down a bit. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, it's simple and all that. And you don't have to make any decisions and so forth. How to stop it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll have to have a think about that one. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Could it not be seen as a more highly developed form of rocking? Mm -hmm. Like a, a musician may play the same piece of music over and over again on guitar or violin or anything mm -hmm. to make them feel calm in the Possibly. same way as rocking does. So it's a more highly developed form of the same thing. Though. Possibly. Yeah. I think it could have come about through being undiagnosed and all the bullying and pressure from schools. So I think that may have been one of the triggers. Uh, in, in your talk, you, you were using uh, the words autism and Asperger's a little bit at the time. Is that an important uh, difference for you? Right, well, I think um, the differences are mainly in childhood. Like, um, I think there's quite an overlap. Like, autism can go from non-verbal to around my level or a bit higher functioning than me. And Asperger's it usually goes from about my level or less able than me to um, people such as with atypical Asperger's that's harder to diagnose because it has some of the traits and not others. Um, I think the main differences are in childhood, like autism is likely to show more and, and there's more language delay in general but in Asperger's some of them also have um, severe problems that show in childhood and there could be some people that have a diagnosis of Asperger's when they actually have classical autism but they haven't got anyone that's been able to talk about their childhood so I think what I usually aim to do is some sort of um, bring Asperger's out in, in the open, as it's a more hidden impairment, it does need bringing out into the open as um, being the same as autism in many ways, such as the sensory and neurological issues. Thank you very much, it's really interesting. Um, I'm interested in your writing, actually. Um, you, you talk about it a lot and it's clearly very important to you and I was wondering first when it started and also what you find in it. Is it a way of relaxing? Is it a way of expressing? Is it a way of just communicating? Or, uh, right, I, I actually find it really hard. I sometimes find it hard to put pen to paper and actually write things down even though I think up ideas and stories all the time. Um, but sometimes it is a really good way to communicate um, all sorts of things that I, I can't put into words. I did bring my support plan here and it's okay for me to pass round and, and some of the things um, some of the things talk about trust and freedom and why I set it up and how I feel so um, I'll pass I meant to pass it round earlier, but we'll probably stop for a cup of tea soon and um, I'm happy for people to have a look. And there's also my email address on one of them, so I'm happy for anyone to get any in touch because I, I've got a few things written about, um, such as um, it's a really good way of 
expressing issues and getting the right message across, which can be really difficult verbally to know whether you're getting the right message across or not. But I'll, I'll start to pass these round now. And have we got any more questions or anything? Because we'll stop for some tea and it, it's fine for anyone to, you know, have a chat to me then. Or Thanks.